the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And when he got up and followed him, and as he sat at dinner in the house, many of the tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader from the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for about 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she said to herself, If I only touched his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leaders of the house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, Christ. Thank you. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You can see Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Amen. So we are in ordinary time. Uh, Mother Jean talked about that this week in her uh, newsletter article. And it is the time in the Episcopal Church we actually tend to call it the season after Pentecost. Um, but I like the concept of it being ordinary time. And as I was reading the lessons and thinking about them, what I really wanted to explore this morning was how God is in ordinary time. You know, we're in a season where we celebrate the infusion of the Holy Spirit into our lives. Um, with that infusion of Spirit, hopefully we are at least animated to manifest in our lives something of the nature of God. I mean, after all, we are the product of the Maker, and my sense of it is that whenever you look at a piece of art and the Maker has made it, you see something of the Maker in the art. And we are, if you will, at least a portion of the art of God. And God's animating spirit moves us so the question is, how are we in ordinary time? What's God like in ordinary time? We have spent, you know, the first half of the year uh, looking at God in, in his birth, uh, in, in times of great temptation and difficulty, in times of crucifixion, 
in times of great celebration. We've looked at God in extraordinary time, but what's God like in ordinary time? Since that's where most of us live. How is God ordinarily? Well, Hosea, our Old Testament lesson today, in my view, gives us a picture of God uh, ordinarily. The situation was dark and difficult in the time of Hosea. Hosea is probably the second book written uh, in its current form that we have in the Old Testament. First one is probably Amos. Hosea comes along shortly after that. Hosea prophesied in the northern kingdom as they were at war with Assyria. It was very difficult times. And the children of Israel had been busy working to make alliances with all different kinds of powers in order to somehow or other survive against Assyria. And Hosea was prophesying at the time that they needed to be faithful to God and they need to be faithful to who they are. Um, and his way of doing prophecy was to dramatize uh, the nature of the relationship between God and Israel. So Hosea uh, took a woman who was a prostitute and took her and married her. He felt that he was called to do that. And that in, in that um, he uh, took her to his own and she was not faithful in any way. She would go off and find other men and apparently she had three sons, all of whom were not uh, Hosea's sons. But every time Hosea would take her back and uh, love her and care for her and care for the, the sons. Uh, and one time she left all together and he went and found her and brought her back in and, and kept her for, herself, for himself. The imagery, it was a dramatization of the nature of the relationship of Israel with God. God who is faithful, God who loves Israel, God who persistently went after Israel, God who would take care of Israel, save Israel in terrible times. Um, and so the message of Hosea was consistently that God is very much in love with his people and will do anything he can in order to save his people. And in today's lesson, he's a bit upset God is, the children of Israel are suffering and they say, well, if we'll turn back to him, it'll be okay. Their faith recognized that God was gracious and loved them. But God is looking at them and saying, your love and your faithfulness is like a cloud that dissipates in the early morning. You are not faithful. And he's just so upset with them. Uh, but he refuses to abandon them. That Faith, that orientation, that understanding of who God is permeates the Jewish understanding of God. Now, I think most of us don't think that's the case. I think most of us think in the Old Testament that God was a wrathful God and, and uh, he's not the same God as the God of the New Testament, which, by the way, is a heresy. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think most of us have thoughts like that and and... And when you read the Old Testament, I can understand why we might have those thoughts. But the Jews understood God as, as one who had hesed, uh, whose love was enduring. It was steadfast. Uh, it would just never waver. And that's how they understood God. And so it is into that kind of uh, worldview that the, the Jews lived their lives and had their and had their whole existence as a people. Believed that God would care for them somehow. Paul in Romans today talks some about uh, Abraham. Talks about Abraham's faith. Um, and Abraham's faith rests in this sense 
that God will take care of him. God will uh, bless him. God will fulfill his promise that uh, he would be made a great nation. Even though Abraham was an old, old, old man, nearly a hundred years old, he still believed that God would fulfill his promise. And so his orientation or faith was to have trust in God who would, he was sure, would deliver. In the gospel today, we have a picture of Jesus who, in my view, acts out this orientation that Abraham has that's based on their Hosea's uh, prophecy of who God is. Jesus acted this out. Now, Jesus was a Jewish man. Uh, I think we like to think that he was something other than being a Jewish man. But he was fully a Jewish man. Um, and his practices and his dress, his garb, everything reflected that of a, of a faithful Jewish man. And he's engaged, as is often the case in those days, uh, Jews were constantly debating what the law was saying, constantly arguing with one another. So it wasn't uncommon to have people ask Jesus questions, ask a rabbi questions, and they differ with one another. It was, it was part of the soup of the day that Jesus lived in. Um, and so he has been asked a question. He answers the question. He's getting ready to engage in a very interesting dialogue. And suddenly a leader of a synagogue comes in, bows down and says, please come, my daughter's died. If you'll just come, it'll be okay. And unlike me, who would have said, just a minute here, I'd like to finish this conversation I'm having with these people. He would have, he got up immediately, he left, he went to serve, and while on his way, it says a woman touched the fringe of his uh, garb. Basically, that's those fringes that look like they have tassels on the sides that we see, sometimes see Jewish men wear. He was wearing the garb of the day touched the tassel and she was made well and he turned and he spoke to her and he said woman your faith has made you well her orientation to who God is her orientation to the way of relationship with God was such that she trusted that God would heal her and God did it's a constant process of relationship. It's, it's a constant process of engaging back and forth in relationship. One of the things that's interesting to me about uh, the passage where Paul is talking about Abraham is he, he goes in and really explicates this business of faith. It's by faith, not by law. Now, when my children were young and we loved them and we cared for them and we played with them and they were ready and willing to do just about anything that we would ask them to do because children really do want to please their parents even though they misbehave in lots of ways they want to please their parents and as long as that relationship is really cared for it's it's an amazing thing but what I began to notice as we got older and, and the kids got older, uh, we started putting down rules. That didn't work so well. I mean, every time we started laying down the law, they were not, they were bucking the law. Um, and, you know, as I've thought about that over the years, it's the relationship of love that uh, is what God really is interested in. He wants us to care for one another. He wants us to love him. He wants us to love one another. And if we're into that space, then um, it all works a whole lot better. Uh, it's life-giving. It's positive. It's helpful. 
And the nature of that relationship is that when things go awry and things are difficult, we have the capacity, because we love one another, to forgive one another when things go wrong. If it's only a transaction, if we only work under law, then you break this rule and I'm going to make sure you pay. Is that fair? Is that something that you experience? Always wanting the, if the rules to be followed and if you break the rules, mm, it's, it's not a good thing. The capacity for, get, for forgiveness comes because we have a relationship of love. How many of you have uh, watched Ted Lasso? Anybody here seen Ted Lasso? I think it's one of the best lessons of the nature of love and forgiveness that I've seen on television in the longest time. You can set the language aside if you, if you can, but the message is profound. And if you haven't seen it, I'm sorry, this will be a spoiler. Coach Beard is one of the coaches on the team. Coach Beard has uh, done some, really did some terrible things to Ted Lasso, who had been loving and gracious with him. And he goes to see a young man who's called the Wonder Kid in the movie. He's, he's a fellow who had uh, risen up on the team, had done really well, uh, risen up to a high level and then left the team, abandoned the team and went to the team's arch enemy team and became their head coach. And of course, uh, that was just traumatic to everybody, everybody. Um, Ted Lasso kept trying to be kind and loving to, to Nate, the wonder kid. Uh, but other members of the team just weren't having any of it. They were, they were very angry with him. And Coach Beard was probably the most angry with him. And it, he is reminded at a certain point of the love that Ted Lasso had given to him and suddenly realized that he needed to go see Nate. And so he goes and sees him and, and forgives him for having abandoned the team and having been a traitor and had betrayed them. He forgives him. Well, Nate is not really able to handle this. I mean, it's not the way we do things, not in our culture. There's no forgiveness. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You do me wrong, I'll get my pound of flesh. But in this case, Coach Beard comes to him and says he forgives him. And Nate says, okay, this is very difficult. Don't you want to give me a headbutt or something? You know, just, and Coach Beard comes up to him very slowly. He takes him by the head. He leans down slowly and touches his head. And then he hugs him. He forgives him. The whole underpinnings of this comes from an understanding of a God who is persistently forgiving, persistently loving, persistently drawing us to him. It's not the way of our culture but it is the way of our faith. I invite you to practice it. It's hard to practice it and be that leaven in our culture that we need in order to transform it into a loving, gracious, and forgiving society. Amen.